I'm defending uh, that idea, uh, and as long as it links to uh, the nation state. But of course, you're right in saying that it's a problem for the world if it's if it's uh, getting more and more weapons around. Uh, so I'm not saying it's an easy question, but I wanted to answer to what you actually were asking me, and that's the way. And it, this is widely supported. I think you only have probably one party in Parliament who would put in question what I have said. So it's uh, probably a 90% support in Parliament for to what I now told you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. The microphone? No? Okay. The other one. The other one? This one? Yeah. It's broken over Oh, okay. All right. Uh, my name is uh, Christina. Yeah. And I'm also from the U.S. And we spoke during the break. So, um, Again, thank you for speaking, and um, again, I really agree with what you were talking about. And as an American, it is very opposite, and uh, you've been very successful in Sweden with what you've been doing, especially opening the doors to migrants and using their skills, because most of them have so many skills. Mm -hmm. And with you take a look at the U.S., and people are very xenophobic and racist, and a lot of rhetoric against migrants working, you're taking our jobs, this and that. Women aren't being encouraged to work. Um, there isn't a lot of support for children or to have a child. So as a 30-year-old woman who's single and doesn't plan on having kids, and as an American, it's looking very bleak. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so when you speak about older people working, I do agree that that has to happen. Um, but I also worry about uh, how young people feel like, when they th look into their future thinking, oh wow, I'm going to be working till I'm 70. I don't think that, um, that seems daunting. Mm -hmm. So for me, it, it can be, but for me, I feel like it's only 40 years I can do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, especially if I can change my careers multiple times, uh, which you just spoke about, that's something, like retraining is very wise. Um, but so what kind of incentives would you give to the younger uh, generations um, to, because you mentioned changing the mindset of yeah. getting used to a 70 year old being in the office mm. um, instead of just focusing on the older uh, generations, also the younger, uh, younger generation as well to get used to that. What kind of um, things have you done in Sweden for that? Well, the obvious answer is of course to have a high level of good quality education. Um, but even so, we find that um, a lot of them feel that it's hard to get out in, in, uh, in the labor market. Uh, a question we often uh, come to, and I have, I have children in the age of coming out in the labor market, so I have these discussions at home, is that they think that you have to choose an identity. What do I want to become? Which is actually how my generation, the generations before me thought you thought you needed to make a decision. At 20, I decide to become a policeman or I become a fireworker. I think the new thing is not to make that identity too hard. Don't th go around, I don't know what I can do because I haven't made my mind up. Um, just get into the labor market, make it easier with lower thresholds and we have made tax cuts for youngsters, we have made um, uh, schemes of different kinds in Sweden and throughout Europe to help them in, uh, because it's better to be present, it's better to actually have a job, or at least for a while, uh, don't make an identity out of it, uh, it's just a way of you know finding your way, because very often that's where it starts, then it gets in another direction, and exactly as you said, support them with retraining, with um, coaching, if they then want to change their minds after a while, which very often happens. And, and don't describe that as uh, some failure, because this is also kind of, you know, I'm 30, I've had a job, I don't like it, I feel like a failure. Well, no, 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 I mean, most of the years is still ahead. Um, so see the opportunities, and, and it's very much in the mindset, I would say. It's easier to say now because you will find out the situation in Sweden, for instance, that we actually nearly lack now uh, part, uh, uh, you know, we have shortages on the labor market. We have, have troubles finding people. Um, so uh, it's easier to say this when the economy is, you know, nearly overheated. But uh, I, I would have said more or less the same um, if, if the economy is turning down.
Thank you very much, sir. My name is Dabo Adedero from Nigeria. Um, my, I'm not going to ask a question. I'm just going to ask for your opinion and seek your advice for African countries mainly, because um, I read how Sweden moved from a country we, which have lesser job to a country where, where there's a lot of job now. In my country, Nigeria, most of more than forty percent of the youth are not employed, so they don't have a job. To, they don't have anything to do. So this push them more to be an entrepreneur. Most of them do things themselves and all that. Do you think is is going to be an effect in the economy of Nigeria, or is it, what what advice will you give when you are we are facing the challenge of no jobs? What what steps do you take to get more jobs to people? Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm I'm the chair of the Extract Industries Transparency Initiative. That means national resources of value, and how do you? secure transparency and good governance regarding um, the revenues and the contract licenses linked to this. One of our main countries that we work with is Nigeria. So I, I know about the national resources curse, as we call it. Um, you get, you get uh, oil money uh, and think that this will last forever. Um, and the oil money is, is coming in. So uh, you don't need to diversify your society. You don't need to get the kind of skills that you have in other kinds of society to make sure that your service industry will grow, things like this. And the problem, of course, and this is also true in Nigeria, um, what should be used in the best interest of the people becomes in the best interest of a couple of families, um, what we call corruption. So we get very rich families, um, but not used in the best interest of, of, of the country. President Buhari promised the Nigerian people to fight corruption. I think there is still a lot to do. Um, and I know that there is a discussion that if he should stand again or not. Because it links, of course, with a democracy like Nigeria, that the political leaders must really do this, fight corruption and shift over to a more diversified economy. And that means uh, that you need to develop the kind of skills that grows Nigeria out from being just an oil producer and or an oil uh, uh, selling company uh, or country, which I know is the discussion, but it needs to be more of, of this. And small sized business is probably the start of this. You see this throughout Africa. I want to point out that the African <coughs> GDP is now, uh, it's outnumbered the growth of the economy in itself compared to the aid given to Africa. So it's a better c uh, situation now than it was a couple of generations ago, but it's going too slow. And it's extremely important. Why? Because I said there is no growth of the population in Europe. After 2050, the UN system says that the population growth in the world will be concentrated only to Africa. And Nigeria is one of these countries that will grow the most. So. There we really need economic growth in a, in a way which is uh, sustainable but also uh, creating jobs. And it's very hard to do and, and as you know, it must be under the leadership of the African leaders themselves that uh, actually uh, make, understand this challenge. And a lot of them do not. Uh, a lot of them are too corrupt, too old, do not understand uh, the ways of the world. Uh, and therefore they do not diversify the economy as they should. And probably what will happen, I mean, if you have youth unemployment of 40% in Nigeria, you have a quick rise of the population, what will happen? Well, there you have migration. That's the migration of tomorrow. So all these discussions in Europe linking to Syria, you're missing the point. This is, this is not a Syrian question. Look at Africa. Uh, this will be the main thing in the future if nothing changes the main flow of people will be young africans coming up to europe it has already started and europe is not prepared and africa is not doing what they should and that's bad because i think we know and have the means to do much better than we are doing and it's starting to happen uh, in africa as well but not enough yet
evening, Mr. Right. Speaker. Um, so um, I, want I would like to um, talk about the gap between the rich and the poor. Mm -hmm. And before I ask um, the question, I would like to ex um, s explain something. So um, some people are born with advantages, some people are born with disadvantages. That's why um, there's social policy in the state that allowed to like equalize this sort of gap. And in this capitalist world of market economy, um, some people are not happy about the um, the gap, um, the rich and the poor, and that it's how and then that's how the um, capitalist capitalism work and stuff. So um, when it comes to economic policy at the government level, how can we make sure that we don't leave people behind? What sort of factors? Yeah. Thank you. This is traditionally, of course, a question where you will get different answers from centre-left and centre-right. Um, centre-left politicians try to uh, very often to say, well, we should equalise conditions. And centre-right politicians would say, equalise opportunities. Um, so uh, there, there are... Uh, but, but, I mean, we are trying to solve the, uh, the problem that you are describing Capitalism will create wealth and growth. And to be very honest, I don't know what to rely on if it's not capitalism. I think every country that has tried every anything else is a catastrophe. Venezuela is the latest example. I could mention a few others. Um, but it, it creates inequality, yes. Uh, and it differs in the OECD family, so it's not the same. So countries have actually uh, stood up to this challenge in, in different ways. Uh, in my country, you know that internationally we follow this with the Gini coefficient. That's how we, we try to read about uh, inequality in a society. And interestingly enough, one of the uh, highest uh, Gini coefficient has been in the United States, but uh, rapidly most growing is actually China. So uh, this is also a challenge to new societies, and one of the lowest you will find is actually Sweden. <coughs> so how is how how is this uh, has this been possible? Well, high taxation, um, levering of of um, opportunities, uh, good income wage increase also for people uh, of low skill works, uh, which has been extremely important. That we don't have the kind of working poor that you will find in in other societies that creates more equal um, uh, fallout between between people. So I think you can do that. Um, nearly all my elections in my country is about how we should balance this. Um, and incentives for work should be good, but we should also help people uh, that don't, don't have a job. We should hand out also help to pensioners, for instance. But we very broadly accept that it's market economy as a base that will create these values and how to redistribute them uh, is, is more the question. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when rule-based market economy goes out and you see a move-in of corruption, strong men, strong leaders doing whatever they like, that is where you will find the real inequalities. Um, and we have now a drift in the world in a belief again, to my big surprise, that strong leaders are a good idea. I thought we were, had gotten rid of that, but the idea is back again. And they always try to charm us. They always try to say they are so, you know, gifted and strong and they can fix things, but what they usually do is that they fix it for themselves and their family, uh, and not so many else. Uh, and it's a surprise that we, we buy this once again, because that's where you will find the real inequality. And they are not really transparent and not really accountable for what they do. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Chani and I'm from Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. You should. Okay. The other one. Um, so, according to the speech, so are the elder unemployment, or uh, elder workforce over 67, and youth unemployment, and women participation, and migrants are the four main factors we have to consider about. Yeah. So my question is, do Swiss feel that their country 
is being overrun by immigrants. That's the main story. If Sweden, is, if the Sw Swiss, uh, Swedes feel, feel like that. I don't think you will find one opinion among Swedes, but do we have a xenophobic right-wing party like everyone else in Europe? Absolutely. Uh, do everyone support them? Absolutely not. A few like me are devoting their life to fight against them, but uh, uh, they are, uh, sadly <coughs> enough to say, also very strong now in Sweden, 18% um, or something like that. Um, and their ideas is very simple. It's a we and them thinking. We are the ones that are already here, the family, the ones that look like us, talk like me, uh, sound like me, and the others are the others. Uh, so it's a we and them. And them are da dangerous. <laughs> them should be kept away. Them are taking things away from us. So uh, when you start accepting we and them, then you're in a very dangerous territory. And they do this in, in Sweden, as we also see in many other countries. Uh, but you have to fight them. That's, that's democracy. I don't agree, so uh, we, we take the discussion and I say no. The, the uh, multi-ethnic, multicultural society is stronger, better, more tolerant, more open, uh, more flexible to ways of the world, will find its way with new conditions because these we people tend not to like change. So they believe in old ideas. They always think the best time is behind us and that we should move backwards. Uh, so that's why they have no modern solution to, to problems like this. So the answer is the majority of Swedish people have been um, pro-migration. <coughs> there is a rising minority. We try to say them they don't understand the history of Sweden because we used to be one of the poorest nations a hundred years ago with the oldest population in Europe because everyone that grew up in Sweden wanted to leave Sweden. So we had one, one, uh, one and a half million Swedes in a poor country that left for the United States. And you will find them in min Minnesota and northern parts of, of the United States. And 1930s, it shifted around. And since then, we have been seeing people coming to Sweden. So we have now 80 years of migrants coming into Sweden, which has actually made us an enormously rich country. And we have all, you know, citizens from all parts of the world. One percent of our uh, population is of origin Iran. One percent, one and a half percent is from Iraq. Uh, we have a large uh, population from Afghanistan, from former Yugoslavia. I could continue like this. And, and it creates a vibrant society which is very interesting uh, because you know you could find all kind of solutions and new ideas and st the majority sticks to this idea and as I mentioned this is also important in our world of today the world religions are fairly accepted fairly accepted I would like to say that it's perfect because it's not but I mean Yes, we have a Christian tradition, but as I, I mentioned, we have a huge Muslim population, um, and uh, we live side by side most of the time. Uh, this works very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Your Excellency. My name is Debra. I'm from Nigeria. I just wanted to ask, um, you said Sweden has one of the best paternal and maternal leave, like support system for the family, but women have on um, actively contributed in the labor market as much as you expect. So are there policies or initiatives being made towards that? Okay, so what kind of policies to uh, increase female participation rates? And first of all, why, why is this an important question? Um, I mentioned that when we look at schools and universities, the best results clearly today is uh, done by women. So they actually outnumber men when it comes to good results in the universities. So, it, so to start with, it's very odd that the best gifted students should be the one not ending up in the workforce, but actually taking care of children. Um, so the best gifted should be incentivized, and how do you do that? Well, as I mentioned, um, it's about the preschool system. More or less all children in Sweden at the age of one goes to a preschool which is uh, uh, taking care of your children uh, during working hours uh, and of course 
Then, then you have the first year, what to do about that. And then we have a system where we give you a, nearly as much as you had when you were working as a payment for one year. But we uh, direct a part of that time to the father. So the father must take part of the time at home, otherwise you will not get full payment. And uh, that has increased, it's not 50-50, it's not but it's probably more like 80-20. So 80% of the time taken with children and during the first year are women in Sweden, 20% are the fathers, the men. Uh, that learns, which is very good for men, learn to, to cook, to take care of children, to uh, make the dishes, to um, uh, uh, use the washing machine. A lot of things that my father didn't know anything about uh, is actually now common knowledge to younger men in Sweden. So it's also good for, for conditions between men and women. Um, and with this, the employers take for granted that even if a woman says, I'm 30 and uh, I'm not single and I'm uh, planning to have a child, then they will say, well, that's not a problem because you will probably only be away eight months or something like that. Then it's okay. Um, because otherwise they will say, well, we won't employ you because then you will be gone. Uh, so they will say, okay, for how long do you think you will stay? Well, maybe eight months and then my husband will take the rest of the time. Well, that's accepted. So having a child in Sweden for a woman is not leaving the labor market. It's just making a short pause and then back again. And it's this system we have built up that is providing for this. But they're rather expensive. Um, so I'm not saying it's an easy issue. They're rather expensive. A lot of other countries, in especially OECD countries, are trying to do this as well, more or longer. Uh, but the good thing is that it works. It actually creates new incentives, and you can see this in the participation rates. I just want to ask mm -hmm. a follow-up question about this um, employ employment mm -hmm. and regarding the women. Is it okay for the employer to ask um, candidates well, female candidates, um, if they have like family planning within the, so like uh, you mentioned about it, says, um, I did my Bachelor um, of Arts mm -hmm. in New Zealand, mm -hmm. and then New Zealand now has a female prime minister yeah. who is pregnant. Mm -hmm. which, um, so I'm, I'm sort of really impressed by how uh, women participation in today politics. Yeah. And what do you think about some, is it legal in um, some countries to ask that question? Yeah. Uh, I had uh, a couple of female ministers uh, in, in my government who uh, were pregnant during their years in government. I should add, I also had a few uh, male uh, ministers that uh, had children during that time. And uh, you're absolutely right. It's illegal to answer yeah. uh, or to ask that question. but. Just to be frank, not everything is legislation. <laughs> uh, so you could say, well, it's illegal, you can't answer that question. No, but you can think. Mm. Uh, the employers can think themselves. In comes a 30-year-old woman, she's newly married, uh, looks very happy, <laughs> and uh, she, so she wants uh, a job here. I can't ask her if she will have a child, but I can think. So if you, if you create a system uh, where you take for granted that, well, even if she has a child, you, she will soon be back. Then it's not such an issue. And that's, that's the thing. And then it's much easier for her to be clear on that. Well, yes, absolutely, I might have a child, but I'll make a pause and then I'm back again. So, and I, I would say it took a while, but now this is accepted in Sweden. Everyone knows this. You know, it's a balance between men and women. It's a short interval, and then you're back again. I, I would like to increase what I said about preschool system, even more this support system, which is of ours, which is also needed, because I think that's the answer to the fact that a few women that come back actually go only go in part-time. Uh, that is also not so good, because part-time work is not always the best link to the labor market and it's not best for their pensions, best for their private economy. So we should also provide that women can get back in full-time jobs. Uh, and you can create that solutions as well. So, I, And I, I know that these are different discussions in, in different countries. As I mentioned, if you look at the potential for increase in supply of labor in most of the countries, it's actually related to what you do with women.
that's the main source you can increase easily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and at this point, if you still have a few minutes, yeah. I would like to open. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, please introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, just say who you are, where you're from. Yeah. My name is Laura Mas, and I'm French. And uh, in my profession, I move uh, every 10 years, I move to a different country. So uh, uh, I'm here in Germany since 10 years. I lived in the US. And uh, Sweden would, would might be an option because I think we have a lot to learn to get inspired from the educational health system, social system. And uh, do you think that the immigrant have the exact same chance as a as a, Swe as a Swedish citizen when it comes to <coughs> private corporate and, and job uh, possibilities? No, absolutely not. That would be to lie. Um, I will even add, I think they've had tougher conditions the uh, later years now than it was a couple of years ago. Uh, but do I believe that the Swedish have been a Swedish system, the labor market has been able to uh, make inclusiveness among people that come from other countries? Absolutely. Um, we had a big wave of people coming now 2015, which has actually uh, grown this debate in Sweden that uh, sounds very much like everywhere else. I'm, I'm, I'm frightened to say. Uh, there were talks about too many, we can't cope with that, we can't get them into the labor market. But the, the year before 2015, where we had the highest figure of, of migrants coming to Sweden, was 1992, because that was a reflection of the war on the Balkans. Uh, and we had a lot of people coming from former Yugoslavia, and this, we had the same discussion. So everyone was saying, there are too many, uh, we, we can't integrate them, they will not find a job. You cannot find a Swede today that will say something like that about the people that came from the Balkans. It's probably the best integrated immigration flow we have ever seen. Uh, I actually, in my government corridor as a prime minister, a few doors down, I had a woman with originated from Croatia who was my expert on some of my foreign issues. So she was born in Croatia, now working for the Swedish government. Um, and she came in the early 90s. And there are a lot of success stories li like that. So we have shown before that it is possible, but the answer to your question is that no, it's much tougher. The threshold has been higher. There's a lot of talk about learning perfect Swedish, which is understandable in a way because it's good to know the language of the country where you actually live. But it's ridiculous to say that you need to uh, learn Swedish to be able to, to work. Most of the people that work in the, in the world do not speak Swedish. Uh, so, so to say that that's a prerequisite to be able to work is not true. Uh, so you should take first things first. First you try to get them a job, then you see if their language skills can increase. It very often links because it's easier to learn a language if you have a job. And there is a tendency now, not only in Sweden, to say, no, 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 first we must say that you speak perfect language, know everything about our society and our culture, and then we might see if you could be something for our labor market. And we have these wrong, wrong felt ideas in, in Sweden as well now. So, no, it's, it's been tougher. I made a reg regulation change in 2008, this liberalization of migrant workers, which uh, expanded the labor market outside the European Union. So you are, you're allowed to come from Russia, China, India, all over the world <laughs> if you have a job opportunity in Sweden. And they haven't changed that yet, I should say. And it's been very valuable for Sweden because we have a lot of influx of people also from Asia actually coming into the Swedish labor market. Yeah. So I'm interested about the over 50s policy mm. um, because obviously that's something I'm looking at in the United Kingdom. Because I think it's wrong that we kind of write people off. Yeah. And I think people got a bit experience and want to come out into the world of work. <coughs> and it also will break down this whole notion around a social isolation. So is, is there a policy we're looking at, looking at the over 50 in the labor market in Sweden? Um, 
This is a very good question. Uh, we had a downturn of the economy in the 1990s and a lot of people were laid off and the saying was that anyone above the age of 50 should not try to get into the labor market and, and the feeling was that they were seen as someone who is preparing to leave. So even those who had a job were more like, well, you will soon be somewhere else. Um, we have been working a lot to change the uh, the thinking and the, the views on this, um, and how do you do that? Well, basically, as I mentioned, we, we have made tax breaks for people above the age of 65 to continue to work. Why is that important? Well, first of all, people at above the age of 65 continue to work, but it's also signaled down the system. If you continue at the age of 65, then you can't stop at 50. Um, and if you actually are still to be counted at 65, then you're not soon to leave at 50. So we have a, a lot of, and it's actually the unions in Sweden, together with the companies who have formed uh, alliances where they retrain people at the age of 50, s telling them that you shouldn't stop working, you might change your identity or change your di direction. So retraining used to be uh, younger persons getting unemployed, they should be retrained. No, now we say no people midlife around 50s should be retrained, not because they lost their jobs, but because they are midlife. Um, so now it's the time to start talking about maybe you should add some skills, you retrain yourself. So it's very often people that have a job that starts to retrain and that's the important stuff. So it's not a falling out of the labor market and then we do something. Um, and of course, I would say that, uh, and, and I'm not saying it's perfect again in Sweden because we still have these talks about could you actually get a new job at the age of 60, not so much 50 anymore, but 60. Uh, but I mentioned the rapid race in around 67, 69. And of course, a lot of developed countries are now raising the pension yeah, as you know, and it's done a little, uh, a bit, a bit, bit by bit. We have this discussion as well. Um, okay, I understand why. The problem with that is that it's a collective view on, and, and this is not a collective thing. Uh, it's, it's very individual. We will find people at the age of 65 who really feel, I'm fed up, I, I, I don't want to work anymore. Um, but what we are trying to say that don't collectivize them together with the persons who actually want to work. Because still in Sweden, with everything I've said, the, p the, the part of the population that, that will uh, have their 65th birthday this year, half of them will stop working this year. So half of them leaves at the age of 65. And then we ask them, why? Because everyone else does this. Do you feel that you're uh, you know, unable to work? Absolutely not. We, we, we now look at the physical strength of 70 year olds and we find that they are now at the same level as the last generation were at the age of 50. Yeah. So the today 70 year olds are fit like 50 year olds was just a couple of decades ago. So to say that they can't work is ridiculous. They are probably you know in better shape than <laughs> a lot of people with small children at home at the age of 35. So, so um, start with the ones that want to keep on working, incentivize them, show them uh, up, and that is what is happening. So the long answer is that it takes a while, uh, but that's the way to do it. And now it's really starting to happen, I think, in Sweden at least.